thousands of people have mysteriously vanished in America's wilderness. Join us as we dive into the deep end of the unexplainable and try to piece together what happened. You are listening to Locations Unknown. What's up, everybody, and welcome back to Locations Unknown. I am Joe Arado, and with me, as always, is the man who can plug a USB stick in right the first time, Mike <laughs> Van de Bogart. Thanks for that intro, Joe, and uh, thanks to everybody for tuning in. Right off the top, I want to uh, mention that we have a correction from our previous episode. We had the dates wrong. Uh, it doesn't change the facts of the case, but... We said uh, the 6th when actually um, he went missing on the 14th, so just a a slight correction there. Some other exciting news, as you know, we are uh, collaborating with the website strangeoutdoors.com. They recently posted an article about the Alaska Triangle that utilized a lot of our research from our episodes. So head over to uh, strangeoutdoors.com if you've already listened to our show and uh, read the article and we're just excited to be working with them and uh, stay tuned for a lot of exciting collaboration coming up yeah that's great i'm glad that we caught the mistake and it wasn't uh right. one of you guys it's always <laughs> fine if you do and we'll always retry but i'm glad that we able we we do try and double check our work even after we post it yeah uh, i want to give a special shout out to keith his trail name is Bearded Pig. <laughs> I met Keith on a bar stool in Tampa, Florida with a buddy of mine. And uh, he's doing a solo of the Trans Catalina Trail in California. Wow. So he's a big fan of the show now, especially after I met him in person. So we wish him luck on his adventure. And we look forward to seeing some of the pictures. I think uh, once I get some, I'll repost them on Facebook so you can you guys can see. Absolutely. Speaking of a long solo hike, if you're ever doing that stuff and are in pain, I recommend Verger CBD products. They have lots of different things available for you. So they can relax you, rejuvenate you, or help with your concentration. Make sure you check them out on Facebook or at their website at vergermed.com. That's verger, V-E-R-D-U-R-E-M-E-D.com. Do you like that organic ad read? I did. It's good. (laughs) All right, everybody, let's gear up and get out to explore locations unknown. January 31st, 1959, a 23-year-old ski hiker named Igor Dietlov embarked on a journey to reach the peak of Otorten, a mountain in the northern Urals. The Soviet college student brought a team of eight experienced hikers from the Ural Polytechnical Institute along with him for the adventure. Before he left, Dietlov had told his sports club that he and his team would send them a telegram as soon as they returned. On February 2nd, the group set up camp on the slopes of the now-named Dietlov Pass. During the night, something forced the members of the group to tear out of their tents, fleeing into the sub-zero winter climate. Join us this week as we investigate what could have caused the group to run from the safety of their camp and the mysterious circumstances that led to their deaths. This is the story of the Dietlov Pass. The Ural Mountains are a mountain range that runs from north to south through western Russia, from the coast of the Arctic Ocean to the Ural River and northwestern Kazakhstan. The mountain range forms part of the conventional boundary between the continents of Europe and Asia. The mountains are rich in resources including metal ores, coal, and precious and semi-precious stones. Since the 18th century, the mountains have contributed significantly to the mining sector of the Russian economy. The climate in the Urals is continental. The average January temperatures increase in the western areas from minus 20 degrees Celsius in the polar 
to minus 15 degrees Celsius in the south, southern Urals, and in the corresponding temperatures in July are 50 degrees Fahrenheit and 68 degrees Fahrenheit. Our group was in the northern part of the Urals. The northern Urals are dominated by conifers, namely Siberian firs, Siberian pines, Scots pines, Siberian spruce, Norway spruce, and Siberian larch. So lots of pine trees. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> as well uh, by uh, silver and downy birches. The forests are much sparser in this portion based on the climate. I'm kind of picturing a terrain and a climate probably that we would find in, you know, high elevations in the Rockies, maybe. Yeah, I think that's that's that sounds kind about of right. like a th- between, you know, like a thousand feet below probably the tree line. It, it gets, starts getting sparser there. There's a lot of, you know, pines and it gets cold. Yeah. The Ural Forest is inhabited by animals such as um, elk, brown bear, fox, wolf, wolverines lynx so it's got some some predators but yeah brown bears um you know i'm not i wouldn't worry too much about brown bears uh but yeah you you know you got to be careful of any wildlife when you're out out in nature so yeah absolutely you can kind of just picture any kind of upper elevation area in the rockies or if you've been out to like montana montana yeah yeah i think this is a good time too to hit the elephant in the room that this is clearly not a national park in the united states Yes, if if you didn't realize, we're in Russia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We wanted to do something a little bit different that we keep doing these cases and they're super interesting. It's, it's a really good story, so I figured it was it was worth leaving the United States just to tell it. And if any producers from the X-Files are listening, call us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'll, yeah, I'll, ju- I'll jump right into it. Um, there's going to be a lot more of, I did the timeline on this one, so there'll be a lot more of me, so just jump in and ask questions. What's really interesting about this case is the number of photographs and the documentation for such a dated event. So this happened in 1959, but there are a ton of photos that the group took on their trek up the mountains and into the night of their disappearance and then journal entries. So they were able to paint a pretty decent picture of how the group was doing. A lot of times some of these events look like they cascaded by a minor thing here, a minor thing there, and all of a sudden they just kind of snowballed into... The person's way off course, and this happened, this happened, and, and then they and then they just kind of fell off somewhere. Yeah, this is a an experienced group of people, and they documented their their journey very well, and that's mm-hmm. I think what makes it so sinister and so mysterious. So it's going to be an exciting one. Really, they got all these photographs from the campsite that they spent their final days in. So the searchers were able to recover these cameras, the diaries, and it helped piece together the timeline that we're going to go through. Now, were any of these images, were you able to find some of them? Oh, yeah, I have a ton of them. So we'll we'll, we'll post them on Facebook. I think on the website, we'll have to get like an album or something going. You you do the website stuff, so I don't know how (laughs) you're going to do that. But there's a ton of them, and I can uh, we'll we'll get them out there. And just to uh, preface this, I I know of this story, but I haven't really read through the details. So I'm a lot, like most of you probably listening, a lot of this is new to me too, so... I'm excited by this one. Well, that's good. You should be. (laughs) (laughs) Even if you weren't, you have to lie and tell them you are. Uh, That's true. All right. On February 1st, 1959, this is when the team began to make their way through the then unnamed pass. So this wasn't, this pass didn't have a name, but it was leading to Otorton. And I am going to also say, we get yelled at by listeners a lot of times when we butcher names in the show. This is like the most Russian of Russian shows we're going to do. So I'm going to get these names wrong, and I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> That's the first thing I thought when we were doing this show is oh. we're going to get every name wrong. <laughs> I just skipped even saying Igor's middle name because I don't yeah. even can't even begin to pronounce it. So I'm sure somebody will say something, but I don't care. On this one, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So February 1st, 1959. As the group made their way towards the base of the mountain, a massive snowstorm hit them. So they didn't start off in the in the best of conditions. The winds, yeah. they said that the winds must have been bad because they started in a narrow pass. And if you've ever been in the mountains where you get into a break, the wind funnels that way. So it really picks up the velocity, if you will. It's whenever you see you know videos of people standing against the wind and leaning into it on a mountainside. Anyone that lives in a big city experiences this too. Yeah, like Chicago. 
Yeah. So visibility issues cause a team to lose their sense of direction a little bit. And instead of moving towards Otorton, they accidentally diverted west and found themselves on the slope of another nearby mountain. So the thing is, although they were diverted, they actually still knew where they were. When yeah. the storm let up, they did know, oh, hey, we, we went over here and they weren't too far off the path. And they do have an image of like where they were supposed to be and where they ended up. And it wasn't too far away. So they were still doing fine. They didn't lose gear or anything like that. There is some irony in the name of the mountain they ended up at, though. The name of the mountain is Kolat Cycle, I think it is. <laughs> Siakal, which means dead mountain. So wow. that's a little grim. To the indigenous Ma- uh, Mansi people of the region, so that was what they called the mountain was Dead Mountain. To avoid losing the altitude they'd gained, Dyatlov, who was the leader of the group, called for the camp to be made there before their ascent of Otorton. So they weren't far enough where they had to go back somewhere. They just said, you know what, we're off path, but this is still fine. We don't want to have to go down and over. We'll just make camp here and we can adjust in the morning. And I'm assuming they all had the, the proper gear to be hiking in this elevation, this kind of climate. Yeah, proper gear. And you'll see in the images, proper gear for 1959. So you're talking still like a lot of leather that I'm sure yeah. would get weighed down. But they're all experienced outdoors people with that gear at that time. Okay. So they shouldn't be, they weren't surprised by the things they ran into and weren't caught off guard. Okay. So right now we're going to jump to 20 days later. This will all make sense. You have to keep in mind, it's the 50s. On February 20th, the group was supposed to radio when they got back. By this time, with no communication, that's when the search party started. So I'm jumping forward to just kind of explain how they, you know, what caused people to go looking for them. Yeah. So a search party was formed to look for the missing students. The volunteers in the search party hiked through the pass and found the campsite relatively quickly. But the group was not anywhere near the site at all. With this information and the discovery, the volunteer team quickly dispatched the army and police investigators to determine what happened to the missing students. So there was enough sense of issue that as soon as they found that site, they saw enough wrong. They called the army and the uh, police immediately to start an investigation. Though the students were experienced hikers, the route they chose mixed with the time elapsed and the condition of the campsite left investigators feeling like this would be a recovery mission and not a rescue. So Mm -hmm. The, they kind of knew at the time that it passed that it was looking grim already. The investigators did recover the bodies, but the state they were in was what truly baffled the search team. We're talking now around February 26th. They don't have the dates documented very well, but we're jumping kind of into the investigation and how the investigation went through and made out the diaries and what they found. Okay. So it's around six days after the volunteer team first discovered the campsite. So investigators were on scene at the campsite. Strangely, the team immediately noticed that the tents at the site were cut open from the inside. So they didn't open them up. They literally took their knives out and cut their way out of a tent. Yeah, that's just bizarre. Yeah. (laughs) So they're cut open from the inside, and most of the team's belongings, including shoes and boots, were all left behind. So they left in a panic. They just... Yes. Something happened. They're like, I got to get out of here. Just cut the side of the tent open and exactly. ran. Wow. So <laughs> and, and it'll get creepy a little bit later when they talk yeah. about it. But so upon continuing the investigation, they're able to make out nine sets of footprints. Some clearly were barefoot or only in socks. Some with one shoe on all headed towards a wooded area about a mile away from camp. Strangely, based on the depths of the prints, it was noted that they seemingly left camp in an orderly fashion, not running and wild, but single file and calm. So they could have been in a hurry, but they were, they kind of had their wits about them. Uh, so weird. they frantically cut out of a tent and then single filely walk away barefoot in socks in the snow and cold and wind. Exactly. That's just bizarre. <laughs> the investigators followed all these tracks and at the forest edge under a large tree, they found the remains of a small fire and the first two bodies of the group. So the first body, and this is where I'm going to start butchering names. It's, I know Yuri, but the last name, Yuri Krivon, Krivonshenko, Krivonshenko, I think it is. Yuri Krivonshenko. Works for me. And I, and I only say the last name because there's another Yuri, of course, from Mother Russia. It's Yuri Doroshenko. 
So they're 23 and 21. So I'd say like fit right at the top of their game. And despite temperatures of negative 13 and negative 22 Fahrenheit on the night of their deaths, both men's bodies were found shoeless and wearing only underwear. Huh. <laughs> it's They were not dressed appropriately at no. all. I mean, I guess you could, one possible explanation would be they had hypothermia and they were, you know. Yeah. They, they left their tents already in a, you know, hypothermic state. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. And may, yeah, <laughs> I mean, that's all I can think of at the moment. Why yeah. you would do that. Minus 22. I've. We living here in Wisconsin, we know what minus 22 Fahrenheit feels like. And even wearing like, you know, Arctic gear, it's cold. Yeah, I would <laughs> I wouldn't want to be outside for longer than 10 minutes. No, at, with with only underwear on and not walking <laughs> through the snow a mile away. And it's probably yeah. windy, too. So it was noted, too, on the on the tree that they found him under. There were branches broken as if someone tried climbing it up about six feet high. Huh, so almost as if something was chasing them. The thing is, they only found the ones that the the nine sets of footprints and nothing else. Yeah. It's already starting to get weird. Yeah. They then found the next three bodies, uh, those of Dietlov, Zinaida Kolmogrova, and Rustim Solboden. Based on the location of the footprints, it appears that they perished on their way back to the camp from the cedar tree where the first two bodies were found. So we now have five of the nine students recovered Mm -hmm. and three of them were kind of on their way back, not in the same along the same line, a little off, but they had gone to this tree, built a small fire. Three of them tried getting back to camp essentially before they perished. Now, were they all in their underwear or just the first two that were found? They were all dressed inappropriately for the weather. Okay. So the, I mean, it was all different. Like they said, like one had one shoe on. Like it was kind of like, ma- but probably what they were sleeping in. Yeah. So while the circumstances were puzzling, it was very clear the cause of the death for these five was hypothermia. There is no apparent external damage or trauma to the bodies outside of what would be expected from the exposure. So like if you're thinking animal, if you're thinking attacked by people, they yeah. just perish from the cold. And all that was left were the scarring. So they must have gotten so cold in their tents that they were starting to kind of lose it and, you know, experiencing hypothermia, getting probably feeling really hot. And they must have in their, you know, confusion, like I got to rip out of this tent. Maybe I, maybe and we're going to, we're going to, we're going to keep going. And then I'm going <laughs> to confuse you more and more and more. Oh, I love it. Yep. So it was <laughs> noted though, that there were some minor burns and blood around the mouths of a few of the bodies. So that will become important later. Okay. <laughs> now, it would be two months before any of the other students were found. Okay. And the real mystery would really set. So this is, again, it's already kind of weird. This is really when it gets insane. Yeah. So now we're in April of 1959. The remaining students were discovered buried under the snow in a ravine about 75 meters, which is about 250 feet only, deeper into the woods than the group of the cedar tree where they were discovered. Although the condition of these bodies were totally and dramatically different than just simple hypothermia. So different than the other five. Three of these hikers had fatal injuries. So Nikolai Brigilone suffered significant skull damage at the moments before his death. Okay. Ludmilia Dubinana. I, I'm butchering these, so I don't like I said, I don't care. <laughs> and <laughs> Semyon Zolotarov had major chest fractures that could have only been caused by immense force comparable to that of a car crash. Wow. Dubiana was missing her tongue, eyes, part of her lips, as well as facial tissue and fragments of her skull bone. Lastly, investigators found the body of Alexander Kolovatol Kol Kolovatov. Kolevatov, there we go. He was in the same location but lacked any fatal injuries like the others. So he was with the rest of them, and they all yeah. had these like serious fatal injuries, except for him. Wow. So it was hypothesized that the two groups died at distinctly different times. The second group was making use of clothing from others in the first group. So it led investigators to believe that they took the clothing from the others post mortem. Dubiana's foot was wrapped in a piece of Krivnish- Krivnishenko's wool pants and Zolotarov 
was found in Dubiana's fake fur coat and hat, suggested he had taken them from her after she had died. Well, that is just absolutely bizarre. Yeah. You can't even surmise that like they fought over clothing because the people who were fatally injured were the ones who died later. So our my first thought was the first five that they found got hypothermia, stripped their clothes off, and then walked off into the woods. But now it makes it sound that they may have died. Obviously, they said they died from hypothermia, but I don't know. That's <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so... We're going to go to May and really we're going to spend more time on the official theories because there's a lot of them. Yeah. And what's really neat is they like this year, 2019 reopened the investigation into wow. this. So we'll, we'll talk about that later, but that's, that's like, it's still baffling people. Yeah. So May, 1959, the investigation was abruptly ended and the cause of death was noted by the lead investigator in a quote, the cause of death was an unknown compelling force which the hikers were unable to overcome. <laughs> wow, that, it's very vague. So that yeah. literally anything could have happened to him. Yeah, it led to a lot of mysteries about the government's involvement because all of a sudden it was like, we're done with this now. Here's what the official thing is. Move on. To recap, the first five that were found, they ruled that they died from hypothermia. Yes, yeah, so you had two at died of hypothermia at the base of the tree. Three of them appeared to be walking back in the direction of the camp where they succumbed to the exposure. And then it was about another month before they found the other four only 250 feet away, down kind of in a ravine with some major, major traumatic injuries, except for one of them. First couple of questions I have is, do they know how long the second group of the hikers lasted. All we know is they died. They were the second group to die. We don't know how. Yeah. They didn't explain the reasoning behind them saying it was after other than the fact they said it appeared they had stripped the clothing from the others postmortem. So we could, we could assume that they probably died not too much later than the first group. Cause I couldn't imagine, you know, they couldn't survive up there for long periods of time and the conditions and what they were wearing they only made it, I mean, I look at it as, if anything, a couple hours later. Yeah. It's not like days, for Maybe sure. Maybe whatever was chasing the first group found the second group and caused the injuries. So you are, <laughs> you are like, you are definitely on the theory just off hearing it. And I know you didn't read them. You I are didn't thinking this is something after them. You think this is like an attack of some sort. I think something spooked them. And they were so scared, they didn't have time to put any clothes on. They just, that, that's what they were sleep, you know, sleeping in their underwear. And they just got up, cut their, you know, out of their tents. And they all, though they said they were single file walking, that's odd. I would, you know, you'd think they'd be running. But maybe something was chasing them. But I don't know. Then why? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, this is why it's so, such an incredible case. And yeah. you are in good company with one of the first theories from your fellow Soviet comrades that suspected (laughs) that the students' deaths were a result of an ambush by the local Mansai tribesmen. Oh, okay. So this was one of the theories. A sudden attack would account for the way the hikers fled their tents, their disarray, and the damage done to the second group of bodies. Okay. But, there's a but, Yep. the explanation fizzled quickly because the Mansai people were largely peaceful. Yeah. (laughs) So... And the evidence in the Ditloff Pass didn't support violent human conflict either. For one... Well, you would see tons of tracks. And, exactly. For one, the yeah. damage done to the students' bodies exceeded the blunt force trauma one human could inflict on another. So that was like a very key thing is why they said it was like the damage you see done in a car accident. Yeah. And like you just said, there's only the nine sets of tracks. They're able to specifically make out nine individual sets of tracks, and that was it. You know, it's weird that the one person was missing a tongue, you know, eyes, part part of her lips. Initially, I'm thinking, okay, animal predation, but why weren't any of the other bodies consumed? Why was it just her? In that harsh environment, because they were right there, and it was a month later, yeah, it's, it seems weird that it would be just 
those just her, people. Just her. We have pictures of the bodies too. They took pictures oh, as they lovely. discovered them. So like, and they're, they're <laughs> positioning. But I think it's really fascinating with like how they're positioned. It's it's very very weird. Like uh, I think it was uh, the female in the group before. I'm not even trying to guess her name off the top of my head, but she was like almost sitting upright, face first into like a boulder. One of the other theories, investigators then convinced of a swift, violent avalanche. So they thought maybe the sound of the snow collapsing as an early warning of the deluge to come would have frightened the hikers out of their tents in a state of undress, just sending them sprinting for the tree line. Again, yeah. sprinting is a word we don't want to use because they, they made specific note that the depth of the footprints made it seem as though it was walking. Because when you run, you kind of like have that longer footprint because you're kicking. Yep. Like they said, it was very clear footprints as if it was a walk as opposed to a run. And an avalanche would have also been powerful enough to inflict injuries to kill the second group of students. It would have affected the trees. So like there were yeah, no would trees have broken down. the trees off. Yeah, yeah. They would have covered up the other group because they're only 200 feet away. You would 100% know the second you walked into the scene, if an avalanche happened. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I just posted the video to our Facebook page when I was in Colorado, when we couldn't yeah. summit because it was an avalanche and I was in the field and it was like, in the, it looked like a funnel coming from the top of the mountain where there's just no trees anymore. Yeah. It's very, very evident that it happened. Yeah, I definitely don't think this was an avalanche. I'm going to, I'm ruling that out. Yep. I, I'm <laughs> with you on that one. Yeah. Another one to one of your, your earlier theories, paradoxical undressing has been put forth, although it doesn't account for them leaving a warm tent. And why they, why they assume the tent was warm, they had these big, thick canvas tents with, with like the stovepipe heaters in them. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it wasn't like sleeping bags and stuff like they had legit gear. Yeah. Cause I I've been hiking in colder weather. Yeah. And it, it gets cold. Um, even if you've got, you're dressed up and you have a sleeping bag. Oh, sure. But if they've got heaters like that in their tents, there's no reason why they would get hypothermia like inside their tent then. Yep. Agreed entirely. And that's, and that's one thing where it's like, that's one of the first theories I thought of when I was reading it. And then I saw the images and it's like, they have the canvas tents with the stove pipe coming out of it. It's like they would cook their meals in their tent and all that stuff. It's like, it was probably toasty in there. So that was the third theory. There's a bunch of them. This is the fourth theory. And this is something I didn't even know about, which was really interesting. It's called a catabatic wind. And it's a technical name for what's, what they say is like a drainage wind. I'm going to try and explain it in a way that you can visualize. So it's a wind that carries high density air from a higher elevation down a slope under the force of gravity. So it's basically like heavier air. So it's high density air that builds up and f like kind of falls down the mountain. So such winds are sometimes also called fall winds since it's falling. Catabatic winds can rush down elevated slopes at hurricane speeds. But most are not as intense as that. So they say like 10 knots, which is 18 kilometers per hour or less, is typical. They're most commonly found blowing out from large and elevated ice sheets of Antarctica and Greenland. So that's, again, kind of what blows the theory away is it's not typical in this area. You see the Antarctica and Greenland because it's off ice sheets, not yeah. jagged slopes that could break it up on the way down. It's basically like it wants a smooth slope to fall. Yeah, it doesn't like trees and stuff to go through. Yeah, but a fun <laughs> fact about this. So the buildup of the high density and cold air over the ice sheets and elevation play enormous gravitational energy, and they get restricted in this area. So they've been they've basically captured some of these and measured them up to 190 miles an hour. Wow. So, yeah, that would be... Again, uh, <clears throat> out of some strange coincidence that this happened there, you would know that. I, I mean, 190 so. mile an hour winds are going to rip trees out of the ground. It's going to, it's going to blow the snow away. I mean, it, you would, it, the tents would be gone. Yeah. You'd have scattered. I mean, if you found the tents, it, it should be scattered, not all in one spot. So that, that one obviously quickly fizzled. So you can basically tell by these theories. I mean, it, you just think of a bunch of, you know, red army guys sitting in a room yelling at each other in, in Russian, like, <laughs> just like, what are the theories? Let's figure this out. Yeah. <laughs> so one of the. I would say best theories that I read about was a potential fire. Okay. So hear me out of this one. 
in one of the photos, it shows what looks like that makeshift metal exhaust pipe that you'd see out of a tent. For the, for the So like we said, they use this metal stove for heating, cooking. So they found bits of cooked food were found in the vacated tents. So they were cooking in the tent. The idea behind the theory is it's possible that either exhaust was leaking into the tent. Okay. Or it was disassembled because you don't want to leave the stovepipe out of your tent when there's no fire going because you're just going to, you're basically, you have a giant hole. If there's no heat going out, you're letting cold air in. So you have to disassemble these things. So one, I, and this is one that I really like the most. Uh, it explains why they left the tent. It doesn't explain anything else. That's, that's the big thing here. So they think that the thing was disassembled when they thought the fire was out, but you know how you can have those rogue coals. Yep. So if the fire was not fully extinguished, you could slowly be filling your tent up with CO2. So you could imagine the panic if a coal reignites and the tent fills up with exhaust while you're sleeping. You wake up, face burning, all this stuff. You're in a panic, so you cut your way out. So this would explain minor burns around the lips. Yeah. Frantically trying to move something, you know, so if the stove's hot again. Uh, you have blood around the mouth, which is very typical from smoke inhalation. That was found on, I think, at three of the bodies. Yeah. So basically, they cut their way out. So they got out in a panic. So they destroyed their tents, but then basically pulled themselves together and calmly walked away. Yeah. So that, so that this is, again, that theory holds up. Why won't you grab your gear? Exactly. Or, that theory yeah. holds up to the point where they get out of their tents and compose themselves. So it's a great theory, and it sounds like, oh, wait, we might have something, might have something here. But then it's like all nine of them decided to not get dressed. Yeah, that doesn't make sense. I would, I, I like the theory. I, I like the theory in the sense of why you would be in a panic and maybe cut your way out if you thought your tent was burning down. But yeah, yeah apparently the, you know, the tents didn't burn down. And why wouldn't you just stand there? And if it's on fire, throw some snow on it and then grab your gear. Um, I don't know. Yeah. You grab your, like, cause even going to the woods makes sense. Like you've just destroyed your shelter. We're not going to get shelter on an exposed, you know, base of a mountain. So we're gonna have to go to the woods, but you would grab everything you could physically carry. You'd, you'd grab the canvas from the tent to make like a lean to. You'd want to use all that stuff. And then, yeah, get to the woods, compose yourselves and the next day hike out. So basically what it all alluded to is that the Russian government ruled humans out as a culprit entirely. They said, you know, this is not caused by anybody else. So of, of course they began non-human, you know, they began to work on non-human assailants. So one of the things that they talked about, people began to, they say people began to whisper the hikers are killed by a mank and a mank is basically a Russian Yeti. So I assume he's meaner, bigger, and yells a lot and drinks. No. <laughs> so basically, I mean, so they said this is how they accounted for the immense force and power necessary to cause the injuries of the three students they found a month later. This theory is really popular amongst those who focus on the damage to Dubinia's face. So that was the, the person that was missing the tissue. Um, Fragments of the skull were missing. Um, basically, they think that's it. However, she was found face down in some... It was not necessarily a stream. It's kind of like a stream. It was melting snow. So they feel like the partial submersion and watery under snow stream could have also done that stuff too. So that one's kind of out there. Well, A, and it's kind of out there because we're saying a Yeti did it. I'm just trying to think of natural reasons that would cause that kind of blunt force trauma to a body. I can imagine, you know, a fall down a mountain is going to cause a lot of blunt force trauma, but it's going to, the whole body is going to be broken up from that. Yeah, you'd have broken arms and you'd have to be hitting rocks. Yeah, you'd be hitting rocks. I mean, you're, the whole body is going to be uh, pretty messed up from that. You're not just going to have one localized area where there's trauma. Like I think you said one of them had uh, their chest was Yeah, it was just, hit. just the chest. And that's and just especially the chest. if it's a ravine in the wooded area, you're going to be hitting trees. And that's when you're going to be mangled. Not to be crude about it, but like you think about 
falling down and hitting all that stuff. And I mean, I you could honestly, or obviously, you know, like a, a grizzly bear could probably provide the force to fracture somebody's chest or, you know, Oh, when they uh, do that cause... thing where they stand on their hind legs and then do like yeah. the double pod, like push down. Yeah. Thing. I mean, but I'm first sure of all, a you would name for it, but I don't know what it's called. Yeah. We've all seen it on the nature shows where they're exactly when they're trying to break through a big stump. A, there's no grizzlies here. There's brown bears or black bears. They're smaller. Um, and and you they should be see... hibernating. They should be hibernating if it's winter. And you would also see, you know, the bear might eat the person or you would see claw marks or you would you would see bear tracks. I mean, yeah, there'd be cuts and thrashing. there'd be some kind of evidence that they were attacked by a bear. And there's no other large predators in that area that could cause that kind of trauma. So we've you, you kind of ruled out any, you know, large fall because their their entire bodies would be we show signs of that. Yeah, and they were very close to the other group and the ravine wasn't wasn't like a big drop off. So like it it could have been you you have to account for the amount of snow. Like they could have rolled down this thing in a stupor, but again, are not really with enough not with enough force to do the damage that occurred. From research I've I've done and seen on people that have unfortunately, you know, fallen you know, long distances down, you know, mountains and it's, there's trauma to the entire body. You got broken arms, legs, necks. It's, it's very noticeable when someone, you know, falls, you know, a large distance, you're not, you wouldn't just see a chest fracture. Yeah. It's not localized to a small area and you can rule out and I'm ruling out animal. I mean, there's really not animals in that area that could do something like that. Like they said, that tribe, is a peaceful tribe and you know, a single human man is not going to be able to cause damage like that to a body. And the lack of evidence that any other people were even. Yeah. There's no tracks. Yeah. This brings us to people started wondering if there's a military cover up. So I left out some information just for this little tidbit. Small amounts of radiation were detected on the bodies. So that led to wild theories that they'd been killed by some sort of secret radioactive weapon. So those who favor that theory <laughs> yeah. stress the strange appearance of the bodies at their funerals. The corpses had a slightly orange and withered cast. Now I'm going to immediately take this and, and refute it. Had radiation been the cause of the death, more modest levels would have registered. So they said it was a very small amount. It was enough to be picked up by Geiger counters, but so outside of the norm, but not enough that you're in like radiation poisoning level. Yeah. And when the bodies were examined, the corpse's orange hue was ruled as not surprising give, given the conditions they were in. So it was almost like they were partially mummified in the cold. And I guess this is me just taking their word for it. You can kind of get orange from that. So that's how they ruled that one out. I don't know, though, if that's the military coroner saying it wasn't the military. Right. So once once some secret military weapon was proposed, though, it was too. They said it was too sexy of a concept to just let die. Obviously, because it's just that is what you want to believe. There's secret government organizations doing all this stuff. So, yeah. So they think uh, there's that basically catapulted other wild theories. So some say the team was unfortunate enough to stumble into the USSR testing of a concussion weapon, or perhaps like a parachute mine exercise. So this explanation did become popular because it supported by the testimony of another hiking group. So there's okay. another hiking group that was camping about 30 miles away from the Ditlov Pass or Dietlov Pass on the same night too. So they're 30 miles away. This other group spoke of strange orange orbs floating in the sky around the Kilat Sikail, which is where they were going. So a site proponents of the theory interpret as potential distant explosions. So they're thinking that they're seeing the, the, the flash of an explosion, essentially. Wouldn't you then see evidence of that, you know, on the ground of an explosion, like with the trees or. I don't um, know. I, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> so the hypothesis basically goes that the sound of the concussion drove the hikers from their tents in a panic. Yeah. Half close. So like maybe the booms scared them. 
in the first group died of hypothermia while attempting to take shelter from the blast by the nearby tree line. Yeah. The second group, having seen the first group freeze, determined to go back for their belongings but fell victim to hypothermia as well. While the third group got caught in a fresh blast further into the forest and died from their injuries. Now, that seems much more plausible. Maybe the trauma to their bodies was caused by the concussion from, you know, like some ordinance going off in the air. But you would think that would, if if it's strong enough to provide, you know, do that kind of damage to somebody, that it's going to be breaking like trees off and you would see evidence of that in the surrounding area where they found the bodies. Yeah, you would uh, assume that if something exploded big enough to give them damage like that, I think they would have more burns than slight burns on their mouth. I think, I think again, you would, like you said before, they'd be more mangled than just localized attacks, essentially. And then you would have a blast radius. Yeah. You would see evidence of the explosion in the surrounding area from the, you know, the force of the the air from that explosion. You know, you everyone's seen those videos of like an atomic bomb going off, and that the shock wave like levels that house. You know, if yep. it, if they can do that to a body, it's gonna you know snap the trees off. It's gonna move the snow. Yeah, it's gonna be significant, and they'd notice it. I do. Like the theory of some kind of weird military thing going on up there, and they were somehow involved in it, and that's mm-hmm. why, how they died. But I just can't begin to think what would have <laughs> caused those injuries. Well, this will help bolster, I think, your love of the theory. So Lev <laughs> Ivanov is the chief investigator of the Ditlov Pass incident. And he said, and this is a quote, I suspected at the time, and I'm almost sure now, that these bright flying spheres had a direct connection to the group's death. So this was a quote that he said when he was interviewed in 1990 okay, from a Kazakh newspaper. Censorship yeah. and secrecy in the USSR forced him to abandon his line of inquiry in the end. The hikers' deaths were then officially re- attributed to a compelling natural force, and the case was closed. <laughs> So remember that very odd statement of they just close it abruptly? It's because he started investigating into these flying spheres. So, and it's very, it's what is really neat is that group from far away saw them as orbs and thought it was like a flash. There's actually a picture of these things. Oh, really? That one of the nine took at night. So basically the night they died, they took a picture. And uh, I, I should uh, step back a little bit they assume that's what the picture is because the picture is of the sky at night and there's like little orange balls. So that was the assumption because it was corroborated by a group that also saw them. If you think about it, why would you take a picture at night with an old crappy camera unless you were trying to take a picture of something? Yeah. Well, you know, yeah, it's uh, a... now to get too into the the wild theories, but and I don't know if you know this or not, but it has this area that ever you know been a hotbed for like UFO activity. <laughs> I didn't find any. I did look into it a little bit. I have to admit, I didn't extensively try and find it just because I was trying to learn as much about the case. It didn't seem like it. And UFOs don't mean always mean you know aliens. Yeah, it could be like military testing and people saw stuff but didn't know what it was. Yeah, it's a it's an unidentified flying object. It could be a new jet technology that we just don't know of yet. Sure. But I'm just curious, maybe this was an area where the military, you know, tested a lot of their n- new technology and maybe those glowing orbs they saw were related to some new military test. It was something weird. So, um, yeah. as I mentioned, it was February of this year. So, February 2019, Russian officials reopened the case for a new investigation. This time, however, officials said they would only consider three theories. Avalanche, a snow slab, or a hurricane. <laughs> a hurricane. They literally said a hurricane. <laughs> I mean, it, it's almost comical. It, it, first of all, I you know, op- reopening the investigation is kind of bizarre well it's like if they're trying to make people think it's not a government cover-up they're doing a terrible job at it 
Yeah, I mean, <laughs> uh, I, I I didn't know the Ural Mountains were known for their hurricanes <laughs> during winter, but or any um, mountains for that matter. Yeah, I hope somebody proves me wrong because I want to learn about that. If there's like mountain hurricanes going on and I didn't know about it, like, yeah, yeah prove <laughs> us wrong on that one. Yeah, that that would be that <laughs> I, that would be awesome because I want to learn more. Well, this is by far, and I say this every time, but I really mean it this time. This is the strangest, weirdest case we've done. Yeah, it's 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 really incredible, and that's where um, it's it's popular enough and. How we ended up doing this case was because we did the uh, the the Yuba City case, and they called that one the Diet Loft Pass of the Americas, because that one was strange too, but not like this. And that's why I really like this one. And I figured we could maybe leave the United States for once to to cover this one because it's just such a a strange, unexplainable case. And as soon as you feel like it's like a little bit of every single theory could have happened. And that's what's nuts. Yeah. It's it's like, did they have a perfect storm of like four terrible things occur? And they were dealing with it very well, but they just died. Yeah, it's, um, you know, I think the most logical non, you know, Yeti or alien theory is something related to a military cover-up. Either they stumbled across something they weren't supposed to see and they got detained and then they were killed and then the bodies were dumped, you know, maybe from a helicopter or what elevation were they at? Uh, It was, I don't, I don't have it in front of me. It was above tree line where they were probably. Yeah. Cause they, they 10,000 feet. Yeah. They, yeah. I think they had to be, it was above tree line because they had to hike down altitude to get to the edge of the forest. I don't know. It is so many things don't make sense. And I guess, one thing we, I mean, do we have to call in the question the original investigation? Were they truthful in what they were reporting? I Okay, I want to say yes, only because of the, I'm looking at the photograph. I'm looking at them right now, and the photographs tell the story that the investigation does. My only concern is, you know, from history, I, I'm a big history buff, and things I've read about the USSR, obviously they were very good at controlling the narrative and, you know, maybe there's pictures they didn't release or maybe there's details from the scene that didn't make it into the report. I just, you know, the, the whole fact that there's no footprints, you know, I could, I could just picture maybe like they stumbled across a military test going on and, they were scooped up by military forces and then killed and then just maybe dropped from a helicopter back at the scene. And maybe there were tons of footprints around, but in the investigation, they say we only saw the footprints of the hikers to, you know, deflect any, you know, eyes looking at the the military at the time. Mm -hmm. I don't know (laughs) to try to, to come up with something that's logical. The only thing I can think of is the initial investigation just wasn't truthful. Yeah, what was it's found. But that's what I, it's I would agree with you 100% because I mean it's it's very obvious that Russia has been known for censoring, covering things up especially like Cold War era Russia. I mean, we're not talking like the Russia today would do it. We're talking the Russia back then. Yeah, we were pre- preface everything where yeah, we're talking about 1959 Russia. Yeah. But like yeah, even even the image is like it's, I don't want to sound like weird, but it's like, I can't wait to get these images out so that people can look at these things while they're listening. So I think like maybe we'll post like the main image and then in the comments, I'll just like spam Facebook with all these photos. <laughs> don't get our Facebook page banned. <laughs> oh, it's, it's not. So they're old photos. Like you can tell they're, it's, yeah. it's similar to like, you know, when you see the bodies on Everest. Yeah. You know what we can do? Um, I can post the show notes on our pay our actual website with with the images and then we could we could link to them if you want to see them yeah i like that i haven't seen them yet but so the one, I mean, I, yeah, I actually, the one of the one that is crazy for me so it's the body of uh dubiana she's on her knees with her face and chest pressed to a rock that's just bizarre like you don't fall and end up like that 
No. And it's next to like this little stream. Yeah, I just I wonder if it was some kind of kind of military exercise that they stumbled across and uh you know, who knows what they did to him or maybe they, you know, we've seen this in other cases where hikers come across some kind of illegal activity going on. Usually they're just never seen again, but maybe in this case they were trying to send a message. I don't know. Maybe it was Yeti. Maybe it was maybe it was aliens and uh we should we should get the guy from uh, Ancient Aliens to uh do a show on it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. This one just is totally puzzling just because there's so many theories you could go with, but you can pick them apart as quickly as you can think of them. Yeah. I just don't know. It's crazy. It's a 60 year old case that they reopen now. And they, um, I will, I'll make a note too. Cause they, they had a press conference when they reopened the case. One of the guys who was a buddy of Dyatlov that was like supposed to go on the trip, but missed it. Cause he went on a lot of these other subpolar Ural expeditions uh, he said that they went like a month, uh, a year prior to that where they got lost. He said the conditions were way worse, way more difficult. And they were fine. And they were fine. So like that just mm. what it goes to show you is that they knew they were experienced. They knew what they were doing. They've been in those mountains. So they know those mountains. They know those conditions. They've been in worse conditions. So like that's even where like to me, like I said, I thought the best theory for me was the the smoke inhalation cut out of the tent like that. Uh, the, the only one I, that makes sense to me is that one to get out of the tent. Then everything after that makes no sense. Yeah. That's the thing. Every one of these theories, there's like a piece that you could explain. Yeah. But then none of the rest of it makes sense. But even then I feel like that can't be explained perfectly well because they're so experienced to make a rookie mistake like that. I mean, it can happen. You know, experts can make anything can mistakes. happen. Yeah. But like, it just seems you know, like something they wouldn't do is like make sure they don't leave the oven hot and break it down. Or if it was leaking while it was still going. Well, I really like the hypothermia theory until you told me they had these giant like stove heaters in their tents. Yeah, exactly. I could, you know, minus 22 degrees Fahrenheit. I could see how somebody in a sleeping bag in a tent could get very cold. Sure. Uh, especially if it's windy and but the fact that they had these big stove heaters in their tent. Well, and I think the fact that they were in underwear only is where I'm like, it must have been toasting there. Because, well, when we go camping, and if I go camping in cold climates, like, I'll wear a jacket in my sleeping bag. I know. Yeah, I wear, <laughs> you know, long underwear, you know, layers upon layers, and I'm still cold. Yeah, usually I'm <laughs> I'm fully dressed without my shoes. Yeah, it's pretty miserable. Um, I would never in a million years just like sleep in boxers in a cold climate. Unless it was 90 degrees in your tent. In your tent, yeah, which it would never be. Yeah. Melt the tent. Um, yeah, I don't know. Just uh, absolutely puzzled on this one. I don't know. Do you have any other any theories? I We went through every, I think, known theory you could think of on this one. Yeah, I think... Um yeah, I looked through, I looked a lot. I was even looking at comments and old articles to see if like just random spammer people had something to say. And I can't find anybody that thinks they know like specifically what happened. Yeah, I don't know. It's, uh, <laughs> they're, you know, we're even coming up with crazy winds that come off the mountain from gravity. And I mean, it's, that's just crazy. It would be it'd be exciting to know if anybody listening has ever hiked this area. Probably a long shot. I'm sure uh, I'm sure people have. Maybe I if mean, they if you, have. If you think about it, so like if we were expert climbers from a institute right there that focused on that and a group of people died in a mysterious way. I I'm definitely sh- want to hike up there. <laughs> but seriously, you kind of would. To like find out what happened, like the curious, like curiosity to kill the cat, right? Like you'd want to get up there and see what was going on, and you'd want to spend the night there and find out what's going on. So I guarantee someone's done it. Just to like people retrace routes of expeditions all the time. Yeah. Well, if anybody listening has hiked in this area, uh, let us know in the comments. It'd be really interesting to hear from you know people that have been there what the area is like. 
Um, yeah, and I want, I want listener weird. theories, man. I want listener theories big time on this one. I want to hear what people think. Or if there's some new crazy stuff. I mean, we got glowing orbs. We got Yeti. We got... Got it all. We got paradoxical undressing. We got fall winds, hurricanes in the mountains. We got it all. <laughs> Soviets. Yeah, it's Soviet Russian <laughs> concussion yeah. weapons, radioactive is, uh, bodies. So, yeah, wow. So, yeah, this is. Uh, you said it to me pre show. This is an X Files. It really would be an X Files. Um, yeah, you could really. You could turn this. I, I don't know. Maybe you can tell me if there's anybody's made this into a movie yet but if they haven't this would be a there great... i actually just discovered that today there is a movie i'm gonna look there it is. up yep it'd make a great horror movie <laughs> yeah it yeah absolutely. or a sci-fi movie or <laughs> an adventure movie i don't know it's yeah just it, was, it was popular enough that it's called devil's pass devil's pass yep 2013 huh. it was made uh who's in it let me i'm just looking this up <laughs> Show prep, folks. <laughs> well, yeah, it, I'm, this, no, is, I know. this is all this is all legit here. I want to see if it's like anybody that we know, because it's a bunch of Russian producers that made it. Yeah. Oh, okay. So you know what? Here it is. So it's not necessarily on that. It's more of a it's a horror mystery thriller of a group of five students that go to the location of the, the Dietlov Pass incident to make a documentary, but things turn for the worse. Oh, so it's a fake movie about a real incident. Is it a Russian movie though, or is it American? It's all the producers are Russian, but like Tom Cruise is in it. Oh, all right, there's like <laughs> no. all right, Gemma Atkinson's in it. She's like American, but the rest are all Russian. <laughs> oh, okay, well, I may have to give that one a. I'm gonna watch a, that tonight, probably. <laughs> Well, um, once again, yeah, uh, with that, let's, get, let's with let's that, we're going to wrap this one up. Uh, just like to thank everybody for tuning in. It's, uh, if you can believe it or not, Joe, we are, we are at the one year anniversary of the podcast. Oh my gosh. Happy anniversary, Mike. I know. Happy anniversary. I didn't even think to mention this at the beginning. Did I, I just get you something of made of wood or silver. Just buy me, a, what's, just what's buy what's me some it? nice, nice flowers. Some flowers. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, I'm gonna get you flowers now. Don't. But uh, yeah, it's crazy. We've been doing this for one year now. Um, this is our 14th episode, 15th if you count Bear Boy. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, just thanks for tuning in. And as always, I uh, leave comments. Um, you know, Facebook. We're on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram. We're on all the socials. Like us. Leave us reviews wherever you listen to podcasts. Every review helps. And as Joe always says, if you're out hiking in the the woods, uh, leave no trace. 